12 years ago, I began the Life of Christ series with a lesson entitled, Us and Them. And the purpose of that lesson was to establish the setting for the ministry of Christ and for the subsequent ministry of the church at its most fundamental, which setting has two bookends. The Bible begins with the creation, and it ends with new creation. And between those bookends is the cosmos. This cosmos, this universe, this carnal world, from the moment when God said, let there be, which scientists currently describe as the Big Bang, when the universe came into existence and began to expand, to the end point when all things come together in Christ, which some scientists currently describe as the Big Crunch, when the metric expansion of space will begin to reverse and the universe will collapse. Now, before the cosmos, there was another enterprise, the purpose of which was to generate glory for God the Father. And after the cosmos, there will be yet another enterprise, the purpose of which also will be to generate glory for God the Father. But God the Son's current enterprise to generate glory for God the Father is this enterprise, the cosmos. And what I pointed out in that first lesson is that in that context, in the grandest sense of what the church is, who the church is, and wherefore the church is, we are in solidarity with every human being whom the Lord has ever or will ever employ in this enterprise. Among those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose, there is no us and them. There is only us. Adam is us. And we are Adam. Noah is us. And we are Noah. Abraham is us. And we are Abraham. Israel is us. And we are Israel. In John 1, 11 through 12, the disciple Jesus loved tells us, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Now, when we read that, we tend to think that this is where the story of all the losers who had the misfortune of being born at the wrong time comes to an end, and the story of the church begins. Because they rejected Jesus, but we received him. But, beloved, that isn't exactly right. Read John 1.11 carefully in a good modified literal translation of the Bible, you see, many translations here infer the word people in John 1.11. He came unto his own people, and his own people received him not. But in the Greek, the word people isn't there. In the Greek, it simply says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And in order to fill in the blank, his own what? You have to look at the context. And what does the context tell us? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. First, Jesus is identified as God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Second, Jesus is identified as the agent of creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shone in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Who was it who couldn't comprehend Jesus? The darkness. John here doesn't identify the children of Israel as the morally blind. He identifies, he identifies darkness as morally blind. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the cosmos. He was in the cosmos, and the cosmos was made by him, yet the cosmos knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Who was it who rejected Jesus? The cosmos. The whole creation. And everyone in it. Not just people. And certainly not just one people. When John says he came to his own and his own rejected him, he is not making an indictment of the children of Israel in particular. He's making an indictment of the cosmos in general and of humankind, the captains of the cosmos in particular. Now, within the schemata of the cosmos, there are clear and conspicuous divisions of time, and correspondingly in the history of humankind, there have been a number of covenants with God, no fewer than seven, of which are identified for us in the Bible. The Edenic covenant, the covenant of God with Adam and Eve in the garden, the Adamic covenant, the general covenant between God and humankind after the fall, the Noahic covenant, the covenant made with humankind after the flood, the Abrahamic covenant, God's initial covenant with the Father of salvation through faith, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of the law, the Davidic covenant, the covenant of the regency of God, and the new covenant, the covenant of Christ. Now, we live under the new covenant. But the covenants that came before were not covenants that God made with strangers. They were covenants that God made with us. We have a family tree. And for the family of faith, there's only one tree. In Matthew 3.10, John warns the Pharisees and Sadducees, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But Paul tells us in Romans 11 that one tree survived the purge. One tree was not cut down. It did undergo some serious pruning, but it was not cut down. And when God instituted the new covenant, he didn't cut the old tree down and plant a new one. It's still the same tree. Romans 11, starting in verse 16 when the first fruits are made holy, so is the whole batch. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now suppose that some branches were broken off, and indeed those who rejected Christ were cut off. But, and this is vitally important, it was the branches that remained that made the tree holy. If zero Jews had believed in Christ, then Paul might have written that God cut the tree down and planted a new one. But the number of Jews who believed wasn't zero. It was substantially more than zero. I mean, we don't know exactly how long it was between the day of Pentecost and the day when Peter had his rooftop vision, but we do know that from the time of Paul's conversion, it was 13 or 14 years before he began to preach and that it was some time after that that he was commissioned to preach to the Gentiles. The church, it appears, survived in wellness for a decade or more with zero Gentiles. The tree was not only there, but it was thriving. And it was holy because it was made holy by the faith of the first few believers, all of whom were from among the descendants of Abraham. So where do we come in? Back to our text. Now suppose that some branches were broken off and you are wild olive branches grafted among the rest to share with the others the rich sap of the olive tree. We have been grafted into the tree. But wait, there's more because since we have been grafted into the tree, then it is not for you to consider yourself superior to other branches. 
And if you start feeling proud, it is not that it is not you that sustained the root, but the root that sustained you. You will say branches were broken off on purpose for me to be grafted in. True. They, through their unbelief, were broken off. And you are established through your faith. So it is not pride that you should have, but fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, he might not spare you either. Remember God's severity as well as his goodness. His severity to those who fell and his goodness to you as long as you persevere in it. If not, you too will be cut off. And they, if they do not persevere in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For it is within the power of God to graft them back in. After all, if you, cut off from what was by nature a wild olive, could be grafted unnaturally uh, on to a cultivated olive, how much easier will it be for them, the branches that naturally belong there, to be grafted onto the olive tree which is their own? Now, Paul is using an analogy here, comparing one organism to another. And the organism to which he's referring is not a foreign organism. The tree of which Paul speaks here is the organism of the faithful. The tree is the body of Christ. Now, in John 15, Jesus uses a different analogy. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. But that's not the relationship Paul is trying to illustrate here. In Romans 11, the tree is the heritage of the faithful. Indeed, the tree is very much like the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11. And the point Paul is trying to make is that the story of your salvation doesn't start with you and God. It starts with Adam. You know, when most people give their testimony about their salvation, if they have a dramatic story to tell, then it usually starts with something like them and God and an empty bottle of Jack Daniels and a hotel room with a Gideon Bible. Well, how do you think that Bible got there? Did it fall from heaven? Oh, no, a, a Gideon put it there. And why did he go to the time and trouble to make sure there was a Bible in that hotel room? Because somebody else did something to bring salvation to him. That's why I went to the trouble three times in the Life of Christ series to trace the faith heritage of a young girl in the southwestern United States all the way back to Peter. Your faith and the grace you received in salvation didn't pop into existence from the thin air. It came from somewhere. And when you received salvation, yes, God was added to you, but just as importantly, you were added to the body of the faithful. You, who were once a wild olive branch, have been grafted into the tree. And that tree has been around for a long time. And if I may extend Paul's analogy just a little bit, the tree has growth rings and every ring on it is us. It isn't somebody else, whoever they might be. It's us. Now, I've heard lots of people give testimony and say things like, well, under the old covenant, the children of Israel did this and that and the other, but they were a bunch of dimwits. But Jesus came along and set the record straight, and God showed us the way. Now, Peter, James, and John, and Paul, they knew the way, but the church quickly got off track when the apostles died, and by the middle of the second century, the church was a bunch of dimwits, too. But thanks be to God, by some miracle of spontaneous generation, in my case, there was a little white-framed church building in middle America. I don't know where it came from or how it got there, but the people there knew the truth. We start with Jesus and leap from him to 21st century America like everyone and everything else in between is irrelevant. Like we don't benefit from the faith of Abraham and like we're not responsible for the sins of the church. Well, that wasn't us. 
That was them. Friends, my testimony doesn't start with, well, I was born in Ulysses, Kansas, and my parents were Christians, and I was raised in the church and obeyed the gospel when I was 16 years old. The testimony of my faith heritage starts at least as far back as with my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there. The story of our faith heritage goes back at least as far as Genesis 12.1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And Paul puts a fine point on it in Romans 11.25, where he says, I want you to be quite certain, brothers, of this mystery to save you from congratulating yourselves on your own good sense. So the big bookends on this enterprise are the Big Bang and the Big Crunch. That's the big picture. And between those bookends are the smaller bookends of redemptive history. Genesis 12, where the author of our faith planted the seed of faith in Abraham. And the last day when the finisher of our faith will harvest the fruit of that seed. Which, by the way, that's why you'll never find me counting down to the last days. First, because I expect that the latter days will be at least as long as the former days. And second, because I anticipate that God won't dispose of the cosmos until its usefulness has been exhausted. And the cosmos is still expanding, which indicates that God is still pouring energy into it. When the cosmos stops expanding and starts contracting, that's when we should start looking to the skies. But until then, there's work to be done right here on earth. And thanks be to God, under the new covenant, the Lord has provided for the work that we do here to be exceedingly profitable. Now, two months after I began the Life of Christ series, I taught a lesson entitled, This is My Beloved Son. Listen to Him. Number nine in that series. And in that lesson, I demonstrated the folly of the teaching of the new, the, uh, that the New Covenant began on the day of Pentecost, that the New Covenant began on May 24, 33 A.D., when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, Peter preached, and about 3,000 were added to the church. And the folly is that this invites people to relegate the entire ministry of Christ and all of his teachings to the Old Covenant. And all of us know people who do that very thing. Now, generally speaking, people do it selectively. The things that Jesus said that they like, well, those are binding for all time. But the things that Jesus said that they don't like, well, those were spoken under the Old Covenant. Carry no weight. But, beloved, not only is that an extremely cynical usage of the Scripture, but the premise upon which, upon which it's based is false. First, because the 3,000 who were baptized on the day of Pentecost were added to the church. But you can't add to something that doesn't yet exist. The word church is translated from the Greek word ekklesia, which means the called out ones. And Hebrews 11 makes it clear that the faithful of the Old Covenant are among the called out ones. So the church, though not under that name, existed long before the day of Pentecost. Second, likewise, the kingdom of God, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, 33, has been being prepared for us since the foundation of the cosmos. And third, because it isn't the discontinuity between the other covenants of God and the new covenant that gives the new covenant its power, but the continuity. Because redemptive history isn't unfolding in a vacuum. Redemptive history has a context. The bookends of redemptive history subsist between the bookends of creation and the new creation. 
The bookends of redemptive history subsist between the bookends of the cosmos. And that isn't a by the way. That's the point. Because at the heart of the new covenant, at the heart of the covenant of Christ, is the redemption of the cosmos. John 1.29, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the cosmos. John 3.16-17, For God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the cosmos to condemn the cosmos, but in order that the cosmos might be saved through him. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God has been reconciling the cosmos to himself. 1 John 2, 1 through 2. My little, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole cosmos. In Luke 24, 49, we find the following, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, so stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, <clears throat> You all know what Jesus is referring to when he says, stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. He's speaking of the events that would occur a short time thence on the day of Pentecost when the apostles would receive the Holy Spirit. But I want to draw your attention to the, to the words that the Lord uses here to describe that event. He says, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. And he tells them that they will be clothed with power from on high. And with these words, he's doing more than foretelling the events to come. He's also defining those events. Because it's with the salvation of the cosmos in mind that the promise has been given. And the cosmos, by its very nature, is physical. Now, it may be spiritual as well. The Bible hints at that possibility, but most fundamentally and most obviously, the cosmos is physical. And accordingly, whatever promise by which it is to be redeemed ought to be correspondingly physical. And indeed, a physical impartation from heaven is exactly what's indicated when Jesus tells the apostles that they will be clothed with power from on high. Because, make no mistake about it, when the, Holy Spirit descend, when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, they were clothed with power from on high. And the power with which they were clothed has a name. That power is called grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9, Paul tells us, So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of these revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to beat me down, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may be tabernacled upon me. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul reports that to keep him from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations he had been shown, he had been given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to beat him down. Now, for the purposes of today's lesson, the specific nature of Paul's malady 
doesn't need to be identified, except to note that whatever his thorn may have been, he is keen to point out that it was in the flesh. And this is important. Because whatever the nature of Paul's bodily complaint, according to Paul, the remedy that God commands to him to address his affliction is grace. And even though Paul is frustratingly vague about exactly how the grace of God was to address his bodily affliction, when God testifies to Paul that his grace is sufficient for him, Paul ceases to seek relief for his affliction. Perhaps because the thorn in his flesh has been remedied and there's no longer any need to seek relief, or perhaps because Paul has complete faith in God's promise of a remedy and proceeds on that premise. Either way, it's clear from Paul's testimony that he accepts whether on the basis of what he has actually received in the way of relief or on the basis of what he has been promised that the grace of God is an appropriate remedy for his thorn in the flesh. That the grace of God is a power which is fully capable of acting on his body in such a way so as to bring him relief from his thorn in the flesh. This is not only the kind of thing that grace is apt to do, as Paul represents the matter, it is the very kind of thing that grace is designed to do. The very kind of enterprise for which grace is equipped and in which grace and in which grace flourishes. For as Paul seems to understand the matter, God's grace is brought to its fullest expression in infirmities. <clears throat> infirmities of the type over which Paul, for this very reason, now rejoices. Precisely because said infirmities, in, infirmities present opportunities for the grace of Christ to be tabernacled upon him. And the word Paul uses here to describe the administering of grace on his body is the verb episkenao, which is derived from a combination of the preposition epi, upon, and the verb skenao, to fix one's tabernacle, to pitch one's tent. And it literally means to tabernacle upon to cover, as with a tent. And while that is a, uh, a pictographic word, the reality to which it points is a literal reality. What happened to Paul when he prayed that his thorn in the flesh might be removed is that grace, the grace of God, was tabernacled upon him, upon his body, and that's also what happened on Sunday, May 24, 33 A.D., when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the flesh of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. The grace of God was tabernacled upon them. That's the promise of Luke 24, 49. That's the promise of Acts 2, 33. Power from on high, clothing over the bodies of believers in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on flesh. And understanding that gives us the information we need to discern when the new covenant was inaugurated usward. Understanding that gives us the information we need to discern when the kingdom of God was inaugurated usward. Because the Bible tells us exactly when that happened, right down to the very hour. The covenant of Christ... The covenant of grace was inaugurated on Wednesday, September 11, 3 B.C., sometime between 6.15 and 7.45 p.m. That's when grace first made landfall. In Philippians 2, 6-8, Paul says, Though Jesus was in his very nature God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Rather, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Christ emptied himself of equality with God the Father in order to take on the form of a servant and be made in the likeness of men. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8 9 that the currency of exchange in which that transaction of that divestiture was conducted was grace. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich in grace, Yet for your sake he became poor in grace, so that you through his paucity of grace might become rich in grace. Christ divested himself of grace, and he did so prior to the incarnation, prior to becoming the holy conceptus who would be called the Son of God. And what became of the grace of Christ? What became of the grace that he lay aside what became of the life substance that he forfeited in the incarnation? What became of the Lord's holdings in this precious commodity? What became of his reserves of this powerful source of energy? He invested it right here on earth. Now the first evidence we see of this is the Lord's investiture of grace into the world is found in Luke one. 28, and the angel came in to Mary and said, Hail, thou who art full of grace. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. Here Luke reports that when Gabriel visited Mary, the mother of Jesus, he referred to, who, he referred to her as thou who art full of of grace, or thou who has been engraced, or who has been graced. That is the literal meaning of the word that Gabriel used to refer to Mary in Luke 128, caricatomine, full of grace. Or as it's rendered in the Vulgate, gratia plena. And in spite of the fact that the significance of Mary's receipt of grace has been distorted and exaggerated and misused in some traditions, the fact of the receipt as presented to us in the Bible remains. According to Luke, Mary was imbued with grace. Mary became possessed of the life substance of Christ in preparation for the incarnation of Christ. And the Bible tells us when that happened. Because the declaration of grace directly precedes the Annunciation, indicating that the very fact that Mary had been engraced has been decisive uh, in determining either her, her qualifications for or for equipping her for the miracle which is about to take place within her body. And that miracle, according to Revelation 12, 1 through 5, took place sometime between 6.15 and 7.45 p.m. on Wednesday, September 11, 3 B.C. That's when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and the power of the Most High overshadowed her that the Holy Conceptus born of her should be called the Son of God. Now, if you want to know more about that and how I came to that conclusion, because that's a, a very specific conclusion, I invite you to go online and listen to lesson number 403 in the Life of Christ series there, entitled, They Got It. But for the purposes of today's lesson, just know that the moment when grace was introduced into the cosmos can be pinpointed to a 90-minute window, to an astronomical, calendrical, chronological, biblical, and theological certainty, sometime between 6.15 and 7.45 p.m. on Wednesday, September 11, 3 B.C., Grace made its first contact with flesh. And that was a confluence of eternal significance. Because grace had to make landfall before it could do what Jesus promised in Luke 24, 49 that it would do when grace was to be poured out on all flesh. Now, why is that? And what does that have to do with our studies on the Holy Spirit as revealed to us in Acts 2?
Come back next week, and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today.